So we are in week three of this series and um, called Questions for God. And we've asked some tough questions, I think. I don't know. Maybe you have different questions than um, I come up with. I sometimes don't know if I kind of fit in with the norm on the questions I have for God. I don't know if you've ever had uh, that experience. And today I might be way off base as to where you are at, but I think it's a common experience, okay? So the first week we asked the question, why does God seem so hidden from us? Why is it that he doesn't just show up, let us see him, everybody believe, boom, like that, instantly. Billboards in the sky, he can choose the method, but you know, whatever way he wants to do it, everybody that knows there is a God, yes, boom, and believe, and we went through that. And um, you might find it um, helpful to go to uh, that message a couple weeks ago and um, look at it. We have an app that Wyatt so wonderfully put together for the iPhone, and it's also on our website as well, and all the sermons are listed there, and you can just watch them, the video of them there. Also, what happens is in our sermons, we have notes, um, and the notes are on the U version of the Bible app, so you can download that, and under e uh, more, at the bottom of the page, when you get into it, you hit events, and if your location um, tracking stuff is on, and everybody knows where you are all the time, um, <laughs> Thrive Community Church should pop right up at the top of that, okay? And then the notes for today's sermons are there, and you can take notes and then keep them. But anyways, um, so we asked that question. Then last week we asked the question, how do I know I'm making the right choice? You know, lots of choices in life. In fact, um, the freedom to make a choice and the multitude of choices has become the burden to make a choice and the choice paralysis that happens for so many people. And so we went through that. We went through the promise in Isaiah 41.10 that God is always with us. He is by our side and what that all means in the midst of all our choices today. The question we're asking, like I said, I might be way off base and the rest of you are going like, this guy's weird, okay? But this is the question that I thought um, I would like the answer to, right? Uh, why do some people seem to feel your presence, God, while I don't? Am I a spiritual misfit? Okay? Now, maybe that's happened to you. Maybe, like this morning, you're seeing everybody's really into this worship service, but I'm not feeling anything in particular about it. It's okay. It's cool. I'm glad I'm here, but... Wow. Or I've had the experience of being at, you know, invited by these really spiritual people. At least I thought they, you know, were because they're very expressive about their faith. And you get to this prayer meeting that they ask you to join in, and they are just emoting everywhere. And they are praising God. And they are extroverting all over the place. And they are thanking Jesus. Some people are crying, and other people are on the floor. And, Maybe you haven't been in one of those, okay? But, and, and, and you're going, and you're going like, uh, I, your mind starts to wander, and you start thinking things like, um, are they all faking it? Or am I just, God just passed me over, and I am not, I, do you understand what I mean? Have you ever felt that? Okay, at least there's a few people here um, that might feel that way. Or you come Sunday after Sunday and Sunday to church, and you keep faithfully coming to a worship service, wherever it is, and yeah, the preacher is a little boring, and the message, and some of the stuff is the same, and we sing the same songs and stuff, and somehow you're just, you're not feeling much about it. It's like you're hoping that you come away going like, wow, I really, wow, you know? Um, but you just go, oh, okay, you know. And you believe everything that's being preached. It's not like you don't believe the stuff. It's just that you're not, like, <gasps> overwhelmed. Okay? Now, um, you see, a lot of churches these days, I don't know if you realize this, they're geared toward people who are extroverts and feelers on the Myers-Briggs personality inventory, and not to people who are more introverted or thinking. Brant Hansen, who wrote the book um, Unoffendable that we're going to use for our next series, and by the way, it's an easy read, I think. Which, okay, it is in the 24 little chapters. They're almost like devotions. I think he's got some real humor in it. And he wrote another book called Misfit, which I'm quoting a couple things from today. 
And in it, he says, it's no wonder so many analytical types find themselves estranged from a Christian subculture that traffics in emotional appeals. Did you ever notice that? Yeah. Maybe it's you right now, that you felt like a spiritual dud your whole life that you're a stick in the religious mud whenever you've gone, you're Mr. Spock of the Christian church. <laughs> okay? The wallflower trying to follow Jesus. You just don't think you fit in. Actually, I think you're in good company because this is my premise, that over 90% of us, 90% of the time, feel like spiritual misfits. And we don't really, quote, feel much. Okay? I know it's true for me, and now I'm not trying to project on you. Like I said, I might be the weird one in all of this, but I know it's true for me, and I believe it's actually an experience again and again, the experience of the lack of like these wow moments in the Bible throughout the history, from the Old Testament to the New Testament. For most of the time, 90% of the time or more, 90% of the people don't have these whoa experiences. Now, there's a lot of misconceptions, I think, in the Christian church about Christianity in general. And two of the most prominent ones, I think, in our American culture are, number one, that faith is pitted against intellectual inquiry. In other words, you got to be stupid to be a Christian. Okay? Or don't, don't drop your brain off at the door and walk in, and you're going to be fine. But if you think too much while you're here, yeah, you know... Never get that feeling? Okay. The other one is sort of like it. It's that your, your feelings are the barometer of your faith. You know, the more you feel, the more your faith is, and the less you feel, the less your faith is. And so what church has become, for a lot of places, they've marketed those things, and basically they are looking to give you a mountaintop, amazing, Wow experience like a rock concert every freaking <laughs> Sunday. And you almost get geared towards coming to church for your emotional, spiritual fix. And then Monday comes and Tuesday and it slowly goes away. And then by Friday night, Saturday, it's like, oh my goodness, I need it again. And you come back. And you keep coming back again and again as long as you keep getting that kind of wow experience of that was awesome worship you keep coming back and once you go to a Sunday morning and you go like that was okay worship it's time to find another church <laughs> you know what I think happens with that I by the way I am not against having emotional experiences and encounters with God and all you know if you have had I am not diminishing them I am not telling you to deny what experiences you have had throughout your life and that you may have. I'm just saying I don't think it's the norm. I don't go in and expect God better show up in this way, and then I know I'm really worshiping him. But if not, then I guess not. You understand? It's not the norm. I don't see you find a person in the Bible that had that at Abraham. If you look at the life of Abraham, I think there are four times in the book of Genesis that God spoke to him directly out of his years and decades go by without anything. Do you understand? We're talking about those in-between times today. Okay? I'm off a little already. But and, um, So, um, what happens when we focus on our feelings like that and the experiences, I think it leads to Christian immaturity. Okay? It leads us to stay where we're at, to our emotional needs, our focus on ourselves, and our focus on a feel-good event to keep us bolstered. And so it keeps some immature, and others, I think, come in and do this week after week and go like, you know what? If that's all there is, there's no real substance to Christianity. It's just an emotional appeal. I'll find something else. Now, I think what this really gets down to is something that I've been trying to learn throughout my life, and I still am trying to learn, and that's the difference between intensity and intimacy. Okay? Intensity and intimacy. And our society is one that believes, hey, the more intense you feel something, the better or more real it is. 
you realize that? Now, I'll tell you, there was intensity in our marriage. Lisa's gone now, right? She's doing fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, she isn't. <laughs> no, she's here. Oh, you're not. Okay. Here we go. I think we would both say there was mo- there, there's been moments of intensity in our marriage. Mostly good intensity, okay? <laughs> I've been amazed at how little the other intensity that we've had. There's been moments of intensity, and at the beginning, you've got the honeymoon period, right, in your marriage, and it's like, wow, you think your love is real, it is. But boy, let me tell you, after years, the intensity wears away, but the intimacy begins. The intimacy begins. And the intimacy is so much better than the intensity was. Do you know that? I think most people in the... The marriage know that in the end. And the secret is to keep holding on to that intimacy even when the intensity isn't there. Okay? You see, love is not a feeling. It includes your feelings, but it is not synonymous with a feeling. When you feel love, or when you don't feel love and you still love someone and do love and care for your children and your brothers, your sisters, your parents, your spouse, when you do love even when you don't feel it, guess what? That is not inauthentic. That isn't faking it. That's the real deal because love in the end is sacrifice. Love is about the other, not about you. So back to today's question. We haven't even gotten to the Bible yet, have we? Okay. <laughs> um, why do some people feel God's presence and I don't? I'm, am I a spiritual misfit? We're going to look at the Psalms today, specifically one of my favorites, Psalm 73. And when you study the Psalms, there's 150 in the book of Psalms. And if you ever want to look in an actual paper Bible, anybody use those anymore? Um, when you look in the paper Bible, you kind of... It's the middle book, almost, if you just kind of open it up. There's 150 psalms. It's called the prayer book of the Bible or the song book of the Bible. It's a great book. Of the 150, guess the number one type of psalm, if you categorize them, is the lament. And a lament, there's 60 plus laments out of 150. Did you know that? There are three times more laments than there are songs of praise and thanksgiving. And yet when you think of psalms, you think, oh, it's all about hallelujahs. No, it isn't. It's all about mostly about where are you, God? Why am I not feeling your presence? Why isn't it working out the way I thought it would? Why am I distant from you or feel distant from you? That's the number one. Psalm 73 actually isn't a, has aspects of a lament, but it's also categorized as a wisdom psalm. And the man who wrote it, we believe, is Asaph. And Asaph was experiencing the fact that all those people seem to have this wonderful experience in life, and my life is the pits. Why is that? And instead of lamenting only about it, he sees through the experiences to a deeper reality of what life is all about. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at the psalm, and we're going to look specifically towards the end of it, where Asaph concludes, after looking at all these wonderful people with all their wealth and their pride, and they're full of themselves, and why is their life so wonderful, and mine feels like, you know, kind of why am I the misfit in all of this? This is how he... And comes to the end of his psalm. Psalm 73, 23 to 26. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Wow, I love this. This is worth memorizing. Just like last week, I think Isaiah 41.10, you know, Fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will hold you by my righteous right arm. It's a great verse to say almost every day. This is also one of those sections. We're going to learn three things in here, the three ends that we're going to look at. The first of all is now and not yet. Then secondly, we're going to look at no one else. And finally, at nevertheless. Okay? Now and not yet. 
That's our life right now. It's a now and a not yet. Asaph says, I'm continually with you. He actually says this in verse 23 and 24. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. So there is a now. I am always with you. But there's also this not yet about that. He says, afterward you will receive me to glory. Now, no glory. Have you noticed that? Does your life feel glorious? Not so much for me. Now is the absence of glory often. Now is the in-between. The yes, I have been redeemed, but I'm not experiencing the fullness of that redemption. Yes, I am forgiven, but every day I still see my own guilt. Doesn't mean I'm not forgiven. I'm in the now and the not yet. Asaph himself is dissatisfied with his life. That's why he wrote the psalm. He's not fully happy with the way things are. He's not fully happy. Those people seem to have it, and I don't. You know, Jesus started his Sermon on the Mount with somewhat the same reality, and he says at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, this is in Matthew chapter 5 through 7. It's one of his most famous sermons. You may even have a plaque of these words on the wall. They're called the Beatitudes. Have you ever heard of that before? The B attitudes. And they're really the blessings. He kind of flips the script on what's a blessing and what's not. It's just amazing because I think jaws dropped to the dust of the earth. They didn't have a floor where he was outside on a mountain. Like, are you kidding me? When he said these things. But this is how he starts out his sermon on the mount. And he opened his mouth and taught them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Right now you mourn, you grieve. Right now you're not happy with the world. Right now, you're empty, you're poor, you're vulnerable, you feel spiritually bankrupt. That's your experience, but you are blessed. You are blessed. Yours is the kingdom, now and not yet. Isn't that amazing? You know what I love about that? I don't rate my blessing based on how I'm feeling. I rate it on the fact of the depth and of the love and the promises of my God and Savior. Brand Hansen, um, in this book, Spiritual Misfits, he said this, what if an aching dissatisfaction, even frustration, might be evidence of a right relationship with God? I think you need to dwell on that one for a while. You think that's been a problem? That's probably showing you do have a right. If you are happy and satisfied with the way the world is and the way your life is, hmm. Okay? One of the great saints, actually I think she's been considered a saint now, but one of the great models of the Christian life in our day and age, do you know who I'm thinking of? Mother Teresa. Let me tell you, a few years ago, I had um, her book of unpublished, now published, letters um, really helped me out. Um, I think this, I read it in, at Louisiana State University when I was first a campus minister there. And my congregation was the size of you all right here. This is it. Started from scratch. I was single. I was 30 years old. Didn't think I'd ever get married. Where are you, God? I'm in Louisiana. <laughs> Have you been to Louisiana? It's a nice place to visit. Yeah. It was a wonderful time, but it was a, a time of emptiness in my life and loneliness. And then Mother Teresa comes along, and she never wanted these letters published. It was published under a heading, um, the title, Come Be My Light. And it's kind of a lot like the book of Job. If you've ever read through that Old Testament book, it just keeps going and going and going and saying kind of the same thing again and again. It is God's word. I'm not, I'm not dissing that. Do you understand? I'm sorry. I'm sounding like a eager critic. Uh, but it's like once you kind of get her letters sound very repetitive with the same issues. And these were letters she wrote kind of privately to uh, priests and others that she could kind of confess her emptiness and issues to. And here's an example of it. 
She says this, there is so much deep contradiction in my soul, such deep longing for God, so deep that it is painful, a suffering continual, and yet not wanted by God, repulsed, empty, no faith, no love, no zeal. Souls hold no attraction. Heaven means nothing. It, to me, it looks like an empty place. The thought of it means nothing to me, and yet this torturing longing for God, pray for me, please, that I keep smiling at him in spite of everything, for I am only his. So he has every right over me. I am perfectly happy to be nobody, even to God, your devoted child in Jesus Christ, Mother Teresa. Do you think she was faking all that time when she's smiling at the poor of Calcutta and bringing them in and loving them and washing them and modeling that for everyone? Do you consider it, now that you know what was going behind the scenes, that she was a fake? No. In fact, it might even show to more depth her authenticity. I think we've got a weird way of understanding authenticity. It's like if he really feels it, it's real. No, it isn't. Your feelings are fickle. Have you noticed that? No. When you can sing like we did, God is good all the time, all the time God is good. When God doesn't seem good, when times are not all that great, that's faith. Brant Hansen said it well. He says, our feelings have nothing to do with whether God loves us or is still involved in our lives. Nothing. There is no basis in scripture for the idea that if God is still involved with you, you will have good feelings. Unless, that is, your actual God is your good feelings. It's something few in our church culture are willing to admit. I don't feel God around. I haven't in years. And yet, this is how it is for many of us. Okay? It's kind of like he just said, the emperor has no clothes. And this whole thing of faking it that we see in some churches, like you're supposed to feel God all the time so close to you, and the more you do, the more spiritual you are, has been taken away. That's why the psalmist, Psalm Asaph says, Nevertheless, I'm continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. I don't necessarily feel like it. I might not even be experiencing it. I believe it. You are with me. You hold me. You guide me. And there is more to come. That's the now and the not yet. And that is the longest point we will make this morning, okay? <laughs> Second point is no one else. Asaph writes, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. When I read that passage, I go, good for you, Asaph, that is sure not me. <laughs> i got a lot of desires on this earth, and I can't even list them all. But I don't think he is saying in this passage, I don't want water, I don't want food, I don't need shelter, I have no needs. He's not saying that at all. He's not saying, I don't have needs of friendship, all I need is you, God, I'm just a spiritual being, there's no... Not at all. He's not saying none of those things are important. He's just saying he knows that if... He he does not have God. He, all of those things don't matter. And in fact, the people he has been envying through this psalm, if you read it, are the people who had all that other stuff. But he realized they were on a slippery slope of destruction because they did not have God. And he'd rather have God and nothing else than to have everything and no God. He knows that if he has God, then everything else falls into line. But if he doesn't have God, it doesn't matter how much stuff he has, everything is meaningless. That's his point. I think Jesus said much the same. He said, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? You know, isn't it interesting? Have you ever looked at what everybody banks on in this world, what everybody relies on, what everybody dreams about, what everybody aspires to gain. Everybody's pursuing, everybody's holding on to, everybody's grabbing on to, everybody's wanting more of. And everything is going to slip through your fingers. Only that which is from heaven, in heaven, for heaven, will last forever, and that is God and his heavenly realm, which is right here on earth, in your heart, and in your life as well. That's the wisdom Asaph learned through this psalm. 
No one, nothing but God. And then the third point, the nevertheless. It actually starts out this passage, nevertheless, I am always with you. But the last verse, uh, verse 26 that we read, basically says in another way, nevertheless. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And this is where I love what Asaph is doing because he's saying, look, my heart, my strength, I don't put my faith in my heart. I don't put my faith in my strength. I don't put my faith in my ability to think about you, God. My, I don't put my, uh, my faith in me. I put my faith completely in you. You're the nevertheless in my life. No matter what else is going on, nevertheless, you are true. Eugene Peterson said much the same about this whole idea of how do feelings and faith work together. And he said, feelings are great liars. We think if we don't feel something, there can be no authenticity in doing it. But the wisdom of God says something different, that we can act ourselves into a new way of feeling much quicker than we can feel ourselves into a new way of acting. So you don't feel like going to worship. You keep going. And your actions start aligning your feelings to that reality. If you just go with your feelings, for some of us, we'd never get out of bed. <laughs> right? We'd let go of everything. We know that feelings can be great liars to get us to do nothing, to be nothing. We actually, our feelings come alongside after the fact. They aren't to be leading us everywhere we go. You know, um, there may be a day when my mind fails, and I think my kids think that day was like two months ago. <laughs> but you know, where I can't keep things straight, I can't remember things, I get things confused. Nevertheless, God is my God. He has a hold on me. Period. There may be a day when I grow weak, when I can't even get out of bed because I can't help myself anymore. Nevertheless, God is my strength. There may be a day when, you know, all that food that I love to cook and I love to eat doesn't really matter anymore. I don't even feel like eating it or doesn't care. It's whatever. But that is a day that God is still the source of the bread of life. There might be a day when I don't care what I look like, what I wear, how much money is in my bank account, what people are saying about me on social media, what anybody thinks of me, what degrees are behind my name. All those things are going to go away. Nevertheless, nevertheless, God is my God. Nevertheless, he has saved me. Nevertheless, he is with me, and he will take me into glory. Nevertheless, is really what faith is. It is the, in the midst of the contradictions of our lives, we lay a claim, we have a stake of who our God is, how faithful he is, and his promises, and we say, nevertheless. Everything else is a lie compared to the truth in Jesus. I love what Soren Kierkegaard, who struggled with, I would say, a lot of things in his life. He was quite the deep thinker. I can't understand half of his books. Um, and so I don't read them. But I did quote him once in a while. And he said this. This is all that I've known for certain, that God is love. Even if I've been mistaken on this or that point, God is nevertheless love. You know, God says nevertheless to you. So you fall flat on your face, so you denied me, so you betrayed me, so you turned your back on me, Peter. Nevertheless, follow me. Is that amazing? Story in the Bible. Nevertheless, follow me. So there, are every, there is not every character in the Bible, save one, is a spiritual misfit. And Jesus 
himself experiences the contradictions of life. He's not feeling close to God at all when he's hanging on the cross doing the greatest work ever by doing nothing but dying. In fact, God himself absolutely abandons him like we've never felt, nor will we ever need to feel, because he went through it for us. Nevertheless. He still entrusted himself to his Father, and because of his work, because of the Father's acceptance, because of the Father's love for us, God is your God. God is with you. There are a million reasons why God should reject me, throw me away, say, eh, somebody else. But the one reason of Jesus trumps it all. And none of those reasons have a word on you or me and could ever be brought up again against you. So, you're ashamed of what you've done. Nevertheless, God is your God. He's not ashamed of you. So you haven't lived up to your standards or the standards you've pushed off on other people. Nevertheless, you are righteous in God's eyes. So you feel empty or maybe nothing much at all. Nevertheless, God is your God and loves you deeply. So why do people, some people feel your presence, God? Well, I don't. Am I a spiritual misfit? I would say, welcome to the church of spiritual misfits with a misfit pastor. We're in this together. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you this day that um, you are real, you are true, you are faithful, you are good all the time. Even, Lord, when our experiences seem to defy that, even when, Lord, even when our feelings are just not there, help us, Lord, to understand we're still worshiping you. We can still be focused on you. We can trust you implicitly with our lives, no matter our experiences or feelings. And thank you, Lord, for the times when we do experience your touch of grace and the closeness we have with you and that we are yours always. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for that as well. I pray for anyone here today, Lord, that is just struggling with any of these issues, that has been wondering, where do I fit, that they would know today they fit here and they fit with you, that this is whom you're all about, Lord, the spiritual misfits of this world, each one of us, and that we are so supremely valued by you. You've done everything for that. Thank you, Lord, for that. I pray that comes to a reality in all our lives. And may we be a church, Lord, that understands this reality and welcomes all the misfits, you know? Because we don't really belong in the world system the way it is. You never wanted this. We belong with you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for that. This we pray in your name. Amen.